DVC Social Justice website. <coughs> my name is Sangha Niyogi. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I teach sociology and I co-direct the social justice program at DVC with Dr. Ponce from political science. I want to begin by invoking two of my spiritual gurus. First, Paulo Freire. He shows well in the pedagogy of the oppressed, the true focus of revolutionary change is never merely the oppressive situations which, seek, which we seek to escape, but that piece of the oppressor which is planted deep within each of us and which only knows the oppressor's tactics, the oppressor's relationships. Secondly, Audre Lorde, who reminds us that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. We cannot undo injustice working with the tools of the system of oppression. Lord points out the tendency for inclusion to be made contingent on the ability to conform to dominant structures. Movements for decolonization go beyond diversity and inclusion to strive for a genuine engagement with discovering and challenging those parts of the system that emerge from the colonial project. We believe that social justice education has that potential to empower communities, resist and disrupt oppressive power structures and work for solidarity. Our goal is for students to develop and deepen their understanding of who they are by supporting them in broadening their horizons, building passions, and finding their purpose. The social justice degree is transferable to CSUs and UCs. It is interdisciplinary and has community engagement at its heart. Our core course is Introduction to Social Justice, which is taught in several modalities by professors from sociology, political science, history, and journalism. If you have any questions about our program, please email me or Dr. Ponce. I also want to give special thanks <clears throat> this moment to our brother from ECE, Professor Juan Vilicana Huerta. He has been helping us set up our swivel camera for all of these events and all the folks are really enjoying and saying this works well on Zoom. Um, we also have some folks from our social justice club. Would you like to come up and introduce yourself? Yeah. This will catch you. Okay, so Juan, do you also want to come up with this? Yeah, so for, this is uh, Juan, our amazing advisor for the Social Justice Club. And hi, everybody. So my name is Afrin Shamim, and I am the president of the Social Justice Club. Hi, everyone. I am Nate. Uh, I am also the social media and activities coordinator of Social Justice. My name is Alan. I'm the secretary for the Social Justice Club. I'm Juan Huerta Villicaña, the advisor for the club. So we were asked to come here and talk a little bit about the Social Justice Club here at uh, DVC. And mainly what we do right now is we're focusing on, diff uh, on recognizing different cultures and acknowledging cultural diversity so that we can raise awareness about these different practices um, within our community and make sure that when we're talking about things like this, we're keeping in mind different concepts like cultural relativism and, make and being that making sure that we are um, respecting different cultures. And today we're actually talking about um, Indigenous Peoples Day, which is today previously known as Columbus Day. Our meeting is actually happening right now from 3.30 to 4.30. And we have come here to let you guys know of what is happening. So if you guys wanna ask. Okay, so for this semester, uh, basically what we're doing is we're, fo we're focusing on a cultural aspect, uh, diversity. So basically what we do is each week we take a different culture and we break it down. We talk about the diversity, the food, the religion, the practices, everything. We want people to be kind of like more informed basically about what's going on in that culture, what that culture is about, how all these cultures actually are all similar to each other.
Yeah, and so that is basically what we're doing in our general meetings, which, which takes place Mondays, 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. in room LC101 and also over Zoom. And we are also planning on having a lot of different in-person events. And so we've talked about volunteering at food banks in San Francisco and Concord and having different workshops that address things like implicit bias. And actually, some, one thing that was done last year, um, one of our biggest projects is called the Community Resource Document. And in that document, we have a lot of different... <coughs> for uh, different groups, whether it's LGBTQ resources or uh, different disadvantaged groups resources, mental health resources. And that, uh, that document is actually in our link tree, which is in our Instagram, in Instagram bio at DVC SJC. And it has a lot of different resources about different topics that we cover. And here we have uh, flyers for our club. You can see our amazing flyer designed by Nate. And so we can we will leave a few flyers here with our advisor and you can find the um, the Instagram and also the discord for anyone who would like to join the club and be a part of events and come to meetings. Yeah, and so thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you folks. So I will now invite my comrade Dr Albert Ponce to introduce our esteemed speaker for today. I right, welcome everybody and again to our you know second event back on campus since 2020 so it's great to be here and we a lot of us here on this campus have been really working to build a, a very robust ethnic studies department to bring what the students were discussing that knowledge coming from diverse perspectives to be centered and to provide that avenue in a degree form here we're working on it and this fall we were very proud and i was very honored to be part of the team the working group along with many comrades of campus been doing this work to hire a full-time faculty member in ethnic studies so i will you know uh, want to get to it but i also have a couple comments about today today what we're doing here is centering the knowledge of indigenous and native americans and not only here in the united states but and not only in the western hemisphere but the world over. There was a moment in time when power was manifested and built unnatural boundaries. And we see the millions of people moving all over the world, being forced, displaced to losing their terrain upon which they inhabit in the way that they subsist and live. Whether it's here in the United States and here on this specific uh, land that we sit in, stand on today, that in 1844, it was a Mexican land grant handed over to a William Welch that was later then sold off to DVC in 1951 to build this institution of higher education. We are dealing with our own complicity on this territory where we sought to erase the original inhabitants, not mentioned in that initial transaction that attempted to erase the initial theft of this land that we are all inhabit. So we can't forget today is a moment to remember, to really remember, put together that history and to build our knowledge in a further way and to, for us to reflect deeply as, a, as students, as faculty, as a community, to think about the ongoing forms of violences from that initial theft of land to the continual theft of land. Now we call it real estate or venture capitalists buying up homes and leaving them vacant and leaving most displaced on the streets. So today we're very proud and I'm very proud um, just to, to have as a colleague, as a comrade here at DVC, somebody who we just brought on uh, and I will go ahead and introduce him so he can, you wanna hear from him, not from me, but I want us all, I just wanted to frame our, where we're at, where we exist, and we're, we're, what we're about to embark on. So please join us as we, as part, in your participation, but also join us in solidarity as we really struggle for and with the communities that are attempted to be erased. So today we really wanna rest away the old heroes of white settler colonialism, take down those statues metaphorically, symbolically, and realistically, and situate a holiday where we all come together, but not just to celebrate symbolically, one that centers questions of land, political power, and economic resources for those communities on which this terrain was taken from. So Dr. Danny Awika Patsin Cornejo, 
who is Opata, Chicano, Picunche, Chileno, who's now, you know, I, I keep saying, I keep getting the chills when I say this, our new assistant professor of ethnic studies here at Diablo Valley College. Here's, uh, his, his pedagogy and scholarship is rooted in indigenous holistic pedagogical strategies from a hemispheric perspective, as well as the application of these strategies in the service of urban native youth and un other underserved communities through his work as the, at the Institute for Sustainable Economic, Educational Envi and Environmental Design, IC. Danny co-created the Teaching Excellence Network to support educators in, in engaging their expertise in the transform transformation of schools. He's also worked as a public school educator, serving second language learners in Denver, Col Colorado, and high school students as the assistant director of the East Oakland Step to College program. He has also been a musical director for the hip hop and world music collective, Debajo del Agua, an experience that has opened opportunities for teaching world music ensembles centered in the indigenous and African diasporas of the Americas. And he lives with his wife and two beautiful children in, in East Oakland, California. And he just recently, a graduate, earned his PhD from the University of California at Davis in Native American Studies. So please jo join me in welcoming Dr. Danny. I want to see you on your head. Um, yo si mi nobe no tegua ba agikia tereraguada o posudawa doeme teguima mari mari lamien quale tonali ilquit nequa no toca deni ahuika patsin cornejo. Buenas tardes, good afternoon, everybody. I introduce myself in my maternal language of the Teguima Opata Nation of Central Sonora, Mexico. Our ancestral territory is about four hours from Tucson. Um, my people are from, my family is from the village of Oposura, currently named Montezuma, but the Opata name is Oposura. Um, <clears throat> I introduce myself in my paternal language of the Picunche people of the Colchagua region in Chile. It's about two hours from Santiago towards the south. I introduced myself in my adopted language of Nahuatl um, from Central Mexico, Tenochtitlan. And it's important to note the land that we are standing on currently, that Pleasant Hill is standing, sitting on. And it's, a, it's important to understand this land as intertribal. It wasn't just one nation inhabiting this space. You had multiple Ohlone nations. You had the Lijan, the, Mu the Muwekma, as well as the um, Lijan, Muwekma, and um, the Karkin Ohlone peoples. You had <clears throat> the Yokut peoples, and you had um, the Bay Miwok people. A lot of people mispronounce that. They say Miwok, it's Miwok. I was corrected by a Miwok person on that one, so. You know, let's get the pronunciations correctly when and where we can. And um, so the title of my presentation is Our Stories Are the Heart of Theory, Walking the Mosaic Path and Exercising the Ghosts of Missionaries Past. Now, um, what I mean by this is in indigenous nations, oral histories are where knowledge comes from. It's how knowledge is passed from one generation to the next. Therefore, we build theories based on our oral histories, based on our stories, okay? I want you all to reframe just for a moment for, for, for the context of this conversation, I want you to reframe how you view the world. I want you to think about it from an indigenized perspective. And one way to do that is to just take a look at this map right here. This map was created by one of my professors at UC Davis. Her name is Halea Sinajani of the Diné and Muscogee Nation. And it was based on the work of Dr. Jack Forbes, who studied indigenous epistemologies throughout the hemisphere. He's now passed on, he's now an ancestor, but he founded the Department of Native American Studies at UC Davis. Now I want you to notice how this map is oriented. I know there's some things blocking it, but look at how it's oriented. 
what you will notice is it's actually oriented east up as opposed to north up, which is what you see in more, most maps or south up, which you see in some leftist maps, we're gonna put south up, right? But east up is an indigenized way of seeing the world. Why? Because indigenous ways of knowing are rooted in natural law. And so east is where the sun rises, east is the top of the world. Therefore, you need to reframe how you see the world if you're gonna view it through indigenous eyes. Um, but I want you to think about maps as, as a form of inscribing power, okay? Europe would center itself. That's where Eurocentric map making, making came from. Maps made in China would center China. Um, the map that we see today with north up and south down, by default, places a hierarchy in the world. It places the global north on top and the global south on bottom. When you see the map this way, it disrupts that hierarchy immediately. All of a sudden, the Americas, it's not North America and South America, it's, it's equal land across the way. And you can say, see that no longer is the earth divided by oceans when you see it this way, but instead it's united by landmass. You have up here, Canada connects to Siberia on the other side. Down here, Tierra del Fuego. There's a little divide between Tierra del Fuego and Antarctica, a little divide between Antarctica and Australia on the other side. But generally speaking, the world is connected. And that interconnectedness, that interdependency, that relation is central to indigenous worldviews throughout the hemisphere. And so it's important to keep that in mind. Now, this talk is rooted in indigenized worldviews. And I'm gonna point out two before we really jump in. First one is right up here, <clears throat> created by Stolo scholar, Joanne uh, Archibald. Stolo is indigenous First Nations from, from Canada. And she created a, or I mean, what she's illustrating here is indigenized holistic pedagogies, indigenized ways of learning that goes beyond Western conceptions of strictly head learning. How many of you all just sat in a class and were subjected to Frady's banking system of you are empty and we're gonna deposit knowledge in you, okay? There's nothing indigenized about that way of learning, okay? What you can see by, by, um, by the model here is that intellectual head knowledge is a part of our whole knowledge system. Yes, it's important but so is the emotional knowledge. My people call that heart knowledge. Here in the West, we're just starting to catch up with that. We call it innate emotional literacy. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to use that voice. But that's what we call it here. <laughs> I call it heart knowledge. But then beyond that, we got the physical knowledge system, okay? Our bodies are archives. We have embodied knowledge systems. When we suffer an injury, our bodies remember that. Okay, in the West, we call it muscle memory. The athletes, are there any athletes in the room right now or dancers in the room? Athletes and dancers understand that there's a moment when your body is moving and your head isn't even thinking about it. Your body is moving on its own. That's that muscle memory. That's that um, body is archive. And then we have the spiritual knowledge, whatever your spiritual tradition is. Okay, the knowledge that you get through ceremony the knowledge that you get through connecting with the sacred, okay? So that's one framework. Literally, let's remember there's a thousand different nations in the Americas, all with different frameworks, different epistemologies, different languages, different cultural contexts. So I'm gonna point out two right now. This one is the one I'm most rooted in, it's the one uh, rooted in the Mexicayo tradition of central Mexico. And here, it's kind of blocked right here, but within this knowledge system, you have the East, which is related to men's knowledge and two-spirit male knowledge. You have the West, which is connected to women's knowledge and two-spirit women's knowledge. You have the South, which is connected to children's knowledge of all genders. You have the North connected to ancestral knowledge and elder knowledge. And all of those knowledge systems are in sync with the center, 
which is the duality between sky and earth. The duality between sky and earth, which allows us to exist on this planet. The sun hitting the earth, feeding us, okay? Within this framework, there's room for individual and there is room for community in relation to earth. But literally, you could study these frameworks an entire lifetime and just scratch the surface. My point is to just illustrate that this particular presentation is rooted in this tradition. Now is my clicker working? Maybe it works here. Uh-oh. Clicker's not working. I promise everyone it was working during the, the check. Okay. God. I'm not escaping out of this either. Just out and try it one more time. I don't know why it's not even escaping out of here. Hmm? Stop the share. Okay. Apologies, technical difficulties at times come about. There it is. Moved on its own. Okay. Minimize this so that from here we can see it. Okay. Well, I mean it changed, so I'm going to go I'm going to go with it. <laughs> okay, so this this right here is the one and only, excuse me. This is the one and only Eduardo Galeano. Uruguayan scholar, um, brilliant scholar from, from Latin America. Um, and in his book, Memory of Fire, that he wrote in 1982, which is a history of the Americas, written in a be beautiful prose, he writes, <clears throat> I'm not asking you to describe the rain falling the night the archangel arrived. I'm demanding that you get me wet. Make up your mind, Mr. Writer, and for once in your life, be the flower that smells rather than the chronicler of the aroma. There's not much pleasure in writing what you live. The challenge is to live what you write. Now, what, what I take from this quote is, as scholars, we need to stop writing from solely this place, okay? Writing from this place is dry. It's boring. People don't connect. The strongest writers that you have connected with, I promise you, we're writing from the heart and the mind and coming at you that way. Like Galliano did. Anyone who's ever read Galliano understands that he wrote this way. Um, my father gave me the open veins of Latin America when I was a senior in high school. And not only, I, I later realized that that was his dissertation. I don't know if you all knew that. That was a PhD dissertation that he turned into the open veins of Latin America. Nevertheless, that was the first book I ever read where I actually truly connected with the content. And I began to understand, oh, okay. My father was exiled from Chile based on a CIA backed coup in 1973 because, because the US was anti-socialist, anti-Allende at that point. And he, he broke that down for me. He helped me understand, oh, okay. There are wars going on in Nicaragua. This was the 80s, right? The Contra Sandinista War. There are wars going on there because of CIA intervention in Nicaragua, in Guatemala, in, um, in El Salvador. For the first time ever, I was able to see myself in the literature and connect with it in a heart-based way. Okay, so if this presentation brings some stuff up for you, that's okay, because that's how I wrote it. I wrote it to connect to a hard place. Yes, it's working now. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna I'm present in story form. In the first story, I'm gonna share two stories. The first story is called The Broken Clay Pot, Gathering the Fragments and Building a Mosaic Path. 
Okay, so what you see here is a map of the missions in my people's territory, the Teguima Opata territory. These are all of the missions. So our territory is all of this kind of river valley area. And these are all the missions that were built there. Okay. Now, myself and a lot of Chicano people, a lot of people in general are displaced from their traditions. But you have to ask why. Why are you displaced from your indigenous traditions? And in my case, there's many elements. One of them is my family migration story, but the other is an intergenerational history of missionization. Mi missionaries entering our territory and indoctrinating our people and not only enslaving them, okay, as Andres Resendez writes in his book, The Other Slavery, but also committing genocide, also committing assimilation and causing my people, the Opata people, to seek strategic alliances for survival. At times this was with the Spanish, at times with, this was with the Yaqui and other native peoples around there. But in a nutshell, that is why we are displaced from our traditions. Now, this is me at 20, okay? Um, and, and I'm wearing the ceremonial garb for the Mexicayot tradition. Now, for those that don't know what that means, the Aztec dance tradition. Now, for those that don't know what that means, because you might have seen Aztec dancers on Cinco de Mayo or something like that, it's actually a tradition that's way deeper than that, right? Um, long legacy, hundreds of years old, okay? Um, dance is part of the tradition. The Temescali or Sweat Lodge is part of the tradition. Curanderismo is part of the tradition. And, you know, other, other, other aspects are part of the tradition as well. So what the Mexicayo tradition has become in the present is a pan-indigenous space for those who have been displaced from their tradition can come and learn. Learn indigenized protocols and learn and hopefully eventually connect with their people, which was what my case was. Um, and um, it's actually not dissimilar to what you see in the Native American community, which is the powwow tradition. Some of y'all have probably been to powwow before. What people don't know is pow that powwow tradition actually comes, uh, it's about a hundred years old and it's an intertribal tradition. So danza has become in the present, a pan indigenous tradition for people of Chicano descent, for people of pueblos originarios and others, right? To reconnect. So this is me as a rookie danzante wearing my humble whites, right? And um, <clears throat> early on, uh, we have a rite of passage in the Mex Mexicayo community. <clears throat> and this rite of passage is we've got to learn when you have to learn and lead your first dance. And so when we learn and lead our first dance, we get something called ayoyotes, ayoyotlis in the Nahuatl language, but they're shakers that you wear on your feet so that people can hear you when you dance, right? And so <clears throat> I, before I earned my ayoyotes, I was invited to a ceremony on the third mesa, third mesa right here. So this is in the four corners region between Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona. This is the Diné Res. And for those that don't know, the Hopi reservation is inside of the Navajo Diné Reservation, okay? So one weekend right before the school year started, I was a fifth grade teacher at the time. We left on a Friday, we drove 14 hours, my wife and I, to go do ceremony <clears throat> at the third Mesa. We arrive, we were greeted by Hopi elders, we were shown around, they asked us to wear whites to demonstrate humility, then we went into the ceremony. And one thing that people don't understand about um, danza or ceremonial dance is it's not just dance. It's not, you don't do it for the visual. That's why pictures should never be taken, okay? It's actually a prayer in motion where you're giving of your sweat, where you're giving of your tears, where you're giving of the blisters on your feet to bring into your life that good stuff that you want in your life. Okay, 
And so we're dancing under the sun, day one. Okay, they fed us these amazing purple corn tamales. And I make another connection. I'm like, oh, wait, they got tamales in Mexico. Why, why are they making tamales up here in the, in the, in the Navajo res? Oh, okay. It's because it's corn, right? But nevertheless, <clears throat> made that little connection. And then I was worried because then Sunday's coming around and I had to teach on Monday. And so I'm like, I'm like we got to go. We got a 14 hour drive. My wife's like, nope, we got to stay till the ceremony's over. That's the protocol. And I don't know about y'all, but um, happy wifey, happy lifey. <laughs> Anytime I've gone against my wife, I've regretted it. So I don't, <clears throat> and I didn't back then. And so uh, she's watching, I hope. Ah. <laughs> so anyways, um, so we stayed, we stayed. We stayed there and um, we went through the ceremony the second day. And then at the end of the ceremony, we circled up to share palabra passing palabra. And what that means is you share the ceremonial insights that you received while you're dancing. You're dancing, you're praying, stuff comes to you. And then you can share. And then we build knowledge in that way, right? Through oral traditions. And so we're sharing palabra and a veteran danzante who came up from DF, which is Distrito Federal, Mexico City. He came up for this ceremony <clears throat> His name is Cidi Martinez. He broke down something that has forever stayed with me. And he shared with me what I call the broken clay pot metaphor. He said that when Cortez arrived in Tenochtitlan, prior to Cortez arriving, our knowledge systems were whole and complete, which means we had agricultural systems, we had systems of literature, we had martial arts, we had philosophy, we had schools, and on and on and on. And he said that this was akin to a whole and complete clay pot. And he said, the process of colonization after Cortez arrived, essentially took that clay pot and shattered it into a thousand pieces. And that that is the legacy we're currently living in. Now, when, when he said that, I thought it was a beautiful metaphor on the one hand, and it's utterly devastating. And it's devastating because when you internalize that, you start to believe, oh, well, I'm broken. My traditions are broken, right? And so, <clears throat> nevertheless, I began to under, well, so I carried that teaching for a long time. Very soon thereafter, I encountered this amazing author that I recommend to everybody. Her name is Deborah Miranda of the Costanoan Ohlone Nation. And she has this amazing book that those who are here can't see, but it's called Bad Indians, right here. And um, in this book, Deborah Miranda talks about these broken shards in a very beautiful way. And she says, Sometimes something is so badly broken, you cannot recreate its original shape at all. If you try, you create a deformed, imperfect image of what you've lost. You will always compare what your creation looks like with what it used to look like. As long as you are attempting to recreate, you are doomed to fail. I'm beginning to realize that when something is that broken, more useful and beautiful results can come from using the pieces to construct a mosaic. You use the same pieces, but you create a new design from it. Matter cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed. If we allow the pieces of our culture to lie scattered in the dust of history, trampled on by racism and grief, then yes, we are irreparably damaged. But if we pick up the pieces and use them in new ways that honor their integrity, their colors, textures, stories, then we do those pieces justice, no matter how sharp they are, no matter how much handling them slices our fingers and makes us bleed. And I, re I realized that I was surrounded by mosaic fragments. I learned songs here. I learned dances here. I had 
I had recipes from my grandmother here. I had words and terms here. I didn't know how to put them together in a mosaic yet, but I had the fragments. And so Deborah Miranda helped me move away from this notion of being broken to know how do we honor the integrity of each one of these pieces that we carry? And how do we repurpose those fragments for our use in the present? And so that's gonna bring us into story number two, exploring the haunted archive and exercising the ghosts of missionaries past. Now I would be remiss if I did not mention the reality that here at DVC, there are Native American <clears throat> bones being stored at this very moment. And most universities, around the country, but particularly in California, have bones in their archeology span departments that were collected during the 50s for whatever reason. And so just for a second, I want y'all to pause and think about this, okay? What kind of mentality digs up grave sites to study? Just put yourself in this position real quick. If that was your grandmother, if that was your ancestor, just put yourself in your position, okay? The Emeryville Mall, and I'm gonna go off on a small tangent here. The Emeryville Mall was built on an Ohlone shell mound. They dug up bones and put them in Berkeley. They dug up a cemetery and then their mentality was to honor this place, we're gonna call this street Shell Mound Drive and Ohlone Way. That's a colonial mentality. And so I'm gonna get off my, my what do you call it? The box that you stand on? I'm gonna get off the soapbox. Get back to this real quick. <clears throat> so my, my, my haunted archive isn't quite that extreme, but it's, it's a parallel issue. So, okay, my haunted archive centers around an individual named Father Natal Lombardo, who in the 1600s created this grammar right here, which is called El Arte de la Lengua Teguima Vulgarmente Llamada Opata. The art of the Teguima language vulgarly called Opata. And this document, well, this document was created to teach priests and fathers our people's language for the express purpose of missionizing, assimilating, enslaving our people. But what's weird about it, what's interesting is, is that the, the title holds a certain reverence. It's like the art of the Teguima language, vulgarly called Opata. So what he's noting here is is, is they're miscategorizing the language. It's actually part of a triad of three related languages, de Guima, Eudeve, and Hova, which the Spanish just clumped into one group, okay? Also, and so I actually found this book um, at, at the Shields Library at UC Davis, dug, digging through dusty archives, and I found it. And I was thumbing through it and I'm seeing, wow, there's a wealth of words and terms, numbers, names of plants, all kinds of important information. There's, there's sentences and grammar and usage and all types of things that I can use to start a process of learning my people's language. <clears throat> and then it hit me, I'm like, wait a second, but it was used by Spanish missionaries to enslave, missionize, assimilate and eliminate my ancestors. So the question becomes, how does one begin to engage with the haunted archive when the trauma of opening intergenerational wounds is inescapable? How does one begin to commune with the unknown ancestral specter contained in the archive? How does one work through the pain of the archive to honor the ancestral knowledge left behind in a way that both preserves the integrity of the knowledge and allows for the emergence of relation with knowledges in the present. How do we take the mosaic fragments contained in this archive 
and repurpose it for the present, for my babies, for my children. How do we do that? Needless to say, I put the grammar in my backpack and I left. But I couldn't open it for a long time. It just stayed in my house unopened. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to pause. I'm going to give you all a little background on my people and our history. And so the name Opata, there's actually two stories of where it comes from. There's the oral history and there's the written history. And, and the real history, in my view, lies in dialogue with both of these. So the oral history says Opo. Opata comes from Opo, which means ironwood. So we are known as the people of ironwood. Ironwood is abundant in the Sonoran Desert. It's a strong wood that we used to use for our ceremonial masks and many other purposes. Okay, the <clears throat> written account says that Opata was a social construction of the post uh, conquest where Spanish military and missionaries, they put three distinct cultural and linguistic groups together, the Teguima, the Udeve, and the Hova into a single essentialized indigenous category. In other words, they couldn't tell us apart. So they were like, y'all are one. There you go, okay? Our creation story tells us that the Teguima emerged from a hill, a cone-shaped hill, cone-shaped mountain in the territory of Bancoachi after an intergenerational flood. In other words, we emerged from the earth right there in our desert home. The Odeve creation story says that we emerged from the ground in a pueblo of Huepac. Little is known about the Hova creation story, but there is, um, we do know that the Hova integrated with the Teguima and the Odeve over time. Ultimately, our creation stories teach us that we are of this place, that we are of the territory of the Sonoran Desert from time immemorial. Now, the written history is only slightly different. It says that there was a migration from a place called Casas Grandes in Chihuahua. Casas Grandes is a massive pueblo there, but there was a migration across the Sierra Madre mountain range. For those that don't know the Sierra Madre mountain range, it's also the Rocky Mountains. It's also the Andes. It's the longest mountain range in the world. Quechua people call it the spinal cord of the Americas. We crossed the Sierra Madre. We arrived in the river valleys of Sonora where the Pima people were living. We displaced the Pima and the Pima named us Opata, which in their language means the hostile people. I think elements of all of these things are true, okay? So again, <clears throat> trying to mix the oral with, with the written. To, to gain a deeper understanding. Now, let's delve into this a little bit because I want y'all to see exactly what I'm talking about when I say religious indoctrination, uh, missionization. There was an abundance of religious phrases in my people's language in, in this book. Here's three. Um, I judge that your father did hear mass. Amo nemasi kai misa vitsa era. Tomorrow we will go to Oposura to hear mass. Chia Oposuragua Misa Vitsidoni Ta Diasak. Having heard mass, et cetera, we return. Misa ne Vitsuad Noue, okay? These are phrases that are designed to encourage people, push people towards Christianity. They're designed for, you have to understand the purpose to the grammar to missionize, right? So, and there's an abundance of these. Now I put it in Spanish. Y'all have to understand that I had to translate it to English because that book is only in Spanish in Opata. And then, so I had to, for this purpose, I translated to English. Um, <clears throat> now, there was an abundance of phrases that forced people to work under the threat of violence in here. So things like, I thought you had to plow. En mavugarea kori erare, o m ne mavugarea kai erare. Um, father said that you would whipped or had already whipped that boy. 
para mí uereki te sachita te guía kai tiuye. The governor that you did not want, uh, the governor said that you did not want to water the wheat. Konauro eme pirikuni kai panuke kamata tui o kai panu ga. Ugh, that's a hard one. Kai <laughs> tui. Um, I command you to whip. Imanado. Okay, so there was an abundance of these phrases. Okay, again, so you see the religious indoctrination and then the threat of violence that is present even in just the grammar. This isn't, this is a document. This is an archive. This isn't, you know, actual, you know, testimony or anything. <clears throat> so the question becomes, how do I exercise Father Lombardo from this text? How do I take the language, the usage and repurpose it Repurpose those mosaical pieces for my babies. Teach them something. How do I do that? And I had to start with my people's concept of creator, or better yet, creation. So actually, in this book, there is a translation of the Our Father prayer. Y'all know that one, right? A lot of, of y'all heard that one. I actually don't know it. I never learned. I just know Our Father who art in heaven, and then I don't know the rest. But y'all know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> okay. So they have that prayer in this book. And we understand that when they say our father, they're talking about an omnipotent, all-seeing, all-knowing, monotheistic, white male God. That's who they're talking about. Our father. <clears throat> and that we have to pray to that God in order to access the sacred. Okay, <clears throat> so how do you disrupt that mentality? Well, I start with my people's conception, not of creator, because we don't have creator. We do have creation, though. And our term is chamahua. Chamahua. Go ahead, try to say that. Chamahua. chamahua. The animating energy of creation, a place where creativity, ingenuity, and imagination bringing forth new and or renewed creation. I can get behind that. You know? <clears throat> and so um, <clears throat> it disrupts not only kind of this white male God, but it also, a lot of people, when they talk about native, native communities, they talk about, and the Aztecs worship the God of the sun. Okay, y'all have heard that one, right? Okay, that notion of pantheon is a Western construction. Let me disrupt that for you real quick. Okay. Aztec did not believe in gods and goddesses. Okay. It wasn't the God of the sun. It was the sun. <laughs> the sun that you can walk outside and you feel the light on your skin. The sun that you can observe hitting that plant and then you're eating that plant. It's that sacred relationship. It's no intermediary of a God. Oh, I got to pray to the God of the sun. So that, no, the sun, go outside and feel that. It's the fresh water in the river, not the goddess of the fresh water, the water. Very, very concrete. Okay, that's indigenous science. Very applicable, very concrete. Okay, so you have to disrupt the notion of pantheon. You have to disrupt the notion of monotheistic God and even disrupt the notion of creator as it's often used in, in native communities. You know, I pray to creator, even that is kind of a, a reinvigoration of the God notion. No, it's creation. It's the animating energy. And my people weren't the only people to, to believe this, okay? The Mexica people have the concept of planequia, the animating energy that divides cells, that moves, that moves plants towards the sun, the animating energy that is so intrinsic, we forget it's even there, okay? And it's not just in the Americas. The Yoruba people in Africa have a concept called Ashe, the life force, okay? In China, they have the notion of Qi. In East Asia, they have the notion of Qi, the life force, okay? And it's present in many other places. <clears throat> so anyways, our father prayer, I saw that and I said, 
wow, this has some really beautiful language. I need to get the father out. How can I do that? How can I do that in a good way? So I replaced the father with Chamahua. And then I said, okay, I got the words, but how do I bring this song? How do I bring this to life in a way that my community can hear it, that my children can learn it, that I can internalize it in an embodied way? Goodness. I don't get why it, can, it works sometimes and not others. Oh, you were going so well. You know what? I'm gonna take it old school. No, don't even worry about that. I'm gonna take it old school. Okay, just do it like that because technical difficulties happen inevitably and we gotta roll with it. So, <clears throat> How did I, so I had the words, but I needed to turn it into something. And so I called up my uncle, David Atekpaksinyam, and I requested a ceremony called the Teo Netzawalitzli. Teo means sacred, Netzawalitzli means to sit and fast. Teo Netzawalitzli is the sacred ceremony of sitting and fasting. In the West, we call it a vision quest. Okay. I don't use that term, <laughs> term is whack. Okay, every native nation has their own word for that, right? Not vision quest. Although nowadays some people use it, I, I'm not with it though, okay? <clears throat> Anyways, the parameters of this ceremony is you have to prepare for a year, at least in the way I've been taught, I should say. The parameters in the way I've been taught. So there's different ways to teach it. You prepare for a year, if you are a drinker, you have to stop drinking. If you're a smoker, you have to stop smoking. I was neither, so, okay, didn't bother me. Um, you have to go to ceremony regularly and you prepare. You create something called prayer ties using tobacco. And you create hundreds of them and, and, and you infuse your intention into them. Okay, what is it that you wanna bring into your life? Okay, it's a, it's a meditation in motion. It's, it's um, and then <clears throat> once you've done all that, and I, this is all in a nutshell, um, you go into a sweat lodge and they put you up on a hill for up to four days. Four days, no food, no water. Okay, now pause for a second. Who in here has gone one day with no food or no water? Okay, a couple. So y'all know what that's like, one day. That's an intense scenario, right? Um, but then on top of that, you're in nature and you're disconnected from these screens, all these screens we got here. Okay. So that's another kind of level of intensity that we're not accustomed to. Okay. We're supposed to do this ceremony four times in our life. I'm going to tell you all a little part of the second time I went up, because we're not supposed to share too much about it, but a little part of the second time I went up. So I go through the preparations. I go up on the hill. And I take the words with me. I take <clears throat> the song. I, I knew it was a song, but I didn't have the melody. I took the words. First thing I did when I was in my sacred space is I broke the words out and I prayed for that melody. And it came, it came like bah, immediately. And I sang that song into existence. And I sang that song for my children every evening so that they know where they come from. And I sang that song at Standing Rock for the water protectors. And I sang that song at the Opata People's Gathering in Tucson, Arizona. And I sang that song for my Chicana Opata grandmother on her deathbed. She had never heard our language. And I felt honored to have the opportunity to share that little piece of our language with her at that time. <clears throat> and so in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day, I'm gonna share that song with y'all now and we'll call it a day on this presentation. Because Okay, so 
A lot of y'all don't know the protocol around songs, so I'm going to learn you. Stand up when songs are sang. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. Just stand up. <laughs> Thank you all. Y'all are welcome to sit down. I'll open the floor to any questions, comments, concerns, trepidations. Zoom, two. <laughs> okay. So we, that was great, great presentation. Another round, yeah, amazing. So with the technology, we're, we'll go around Q and A. You have a question. I'm gonna have to come to you, and then we'll also be taking questions on our chat. And it's great we have like 130 people in this space right now. It's amazing, All right? Online and here, so it's awesome. everyone hello everyone i guess um just want to turn around and say hello to everyone and then i guess i have a i should share more because i come in wearing my um clergy collar more than my just initial um clergy young black woman comment um but i'll say i come in and and i'm very welcome to receive and learn and hear stories um that continue to add to the stories that i have heard which make the um, task that I have as a global missionary more realist on the front of mutual learning, learning who I'm coming to see and that it's not about and in resistance to white male missionary uh, histories. I'm very grateful. This was so informative. As you all could see, I was on the edge of my seat about to scream and jump up and dance with you. Uh, <laughs> also from DB East Oakland, so that was also a plus, yes. I love, just going to comment on this particular piece of the, the, tra the, the exercising and reclaiming. When I was studying the Aramaic of that prayer in the Aramaic language of the Our Father, it's not even written as a Our Father. It has this animating energy of creation where creativity, ingenuity, it has that spirit of creation. And I found that to be very indigenous because that's the indigenous language of the peoples there. And it, it just blows my mind, uh, the, the, the transformative and oppressive nature that the missions have taken. And I'm so very grateful to hear more stories and to be able to be a part of the exercising and the reclaiming and the, the retelling and retelling and sharing. And so, yes. Amen. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, sister, for coming out. Um, I think it's important to note that Christianity is not a monolith. Okay. Um, the Black liberatory tradition of Christianity, Cornell West, Dr. King, is not focused on the family. Okay. Not even close. Those are different universes. So. Um, I think it's incredibly important to note that the liberation theology is not right-wing fascist Christianity. 
right? Um, and that that full spectrum is on display. But um, I always appreciate um, going into dialogue with theologians around some of these issues. Because I think there is a, a, a lot of, um, particularly with those more liberatory Christian traditions, there's a lot of parallels. And there's a lot of um, points of connection. And, you know, I said from the start, you know, Native traditions are about building relations, not, not destroying them necessarily. So I always appreciate that perspective. Thank you. Yes, I have a question. Uh, I have a question, a comment. First, a comment. Um, I want to thank Dr. Ponce uh, for um, pretty much inviting me um, to come here. Um, I remember you actually uh, went to speak into our class, and it was a um, Latinx uh, political science class. And um, even just a little like ten minute excerpt you gave there, I mean, wow, I was hooked. I'm like, I need to, I need to come see this. <laughs> it is pretty cool. Um, so that's just a comment. Uh, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful I was introduced to this. Um, and the question I have, um, you brought up um, that, you know, um, being here in this campus, you know, this is, um, you know, um, telling you campus itself almost is like, you know, stolen land. And um, I was wondering is, you know, cause um, in that excerpt you were talking about um, how um, this is gonna be, if I'm not mistaken, the first, um, ever um, class of this type right next semester um, they're going to have. And I was wondering, um, you know, going into that, um, how does it feel to, you know, um, be here and be able to, I guess, you know, um, tell everyone the story about, you know, the, this land and, um, you know, what, I guess, um, going forward, how can we, um, you know, appreciate what we have while learning the terrible history of it, I guess. Have you ever heard the, the saying, wherever you go, there you are? Yeah. So now add, wherever you go, there you are on indigenous land. <laughs> and, that, and that's the history of the United States of America. We understand it was built on stolen native land and the enforced uh, labor of African peoples. And so you have to understand those pillars. Um, it's, it's wonderful, or I, I'm, I'm, I feel very blessed for the opportunity to build a program from the ground up. And from the moment that I interviewed here, I didn't hold back. And so, um, you know, I assume they hired me because they like me. I don't know. I, I didn't hold back <laughs> and I'm not holding back now. So, um, you know, I think uh, thus far, this campus has has allowed for for honesty, and I appreciate that. Every campus has its issues, and they're complicated issues. The issues around NAGPRA um, and and Native Bones on on campus are um, they're they're very complex because on the one hand, you don't know where those bones came from. You don't know. I told you this is a multinational area when it comes to indigenous people. You don't know what what tribe they pertain to. Um, and then there's an entire protocol and ceremony for burying the dead. And so it's like, um, and and a lot of people, due to what I'm talking about here, don't have that knowledge or, or they don't know. You know, I wouldn't know. What, what to do in, in, in that circumstance. And so um, <clears throat> there, are, there are real challenges. Um, I think the first step is recognition, recognizing whose land you're on, recognizing what their story and history is, you know, recognizing that a lot of the landmarks that we have here in California are named after colonizers. You know, whether you're talking about Fremont, Chabot, you know, the various ranchos that you have, the Peraltas, you know, um, and, and taking the time to go beyond that. Okay, who were the first peoples here that were displaced? Um, I believe that knowledge is power. I know that's a corny cliche. Michel Foucault said, knowledge is for cutting. And I actually, I like that one a little bit more, right? Um, the more you know, you know, you could slice up whack arguments, 
you know, <laughs> when they come up. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> First of all, I'm just so grateful that you're here and thank you for this presentation and your presence. Um, I know the students are going to get so much out of it, but not just the students, even, you know, myself as a professor. Um, and I thank you for uh, talking about, you know, your roots. And it's really interesting to hear, uh, you know, the histories of uh, you're talking about places like Sonora, uh, Mexico and Chile as well. And I could really uh, relate, you know, to a lot of what you are saying. Uh, many of us who identify as Chicano and who are from uh, what is commonly called Latin America and colonized lands, uh, know that we have uh, indigenous blood within us, but very often we don't have a connection to the language, uh, the traditions, and sometimes we don't even know which nation or uh, you know which group we come from. Um, so I'm just wondering if you would you know sort of speak to that. I really love the image of putting together a mosaic out of out of the shards. Uh, but I think a lot of a lot of us um, maybe don't know where to begin. Uh, when it comes to understanding um, our own indigenous uh, roots and past. Um, and even, you know, you mentioned Nicaragua, El Salvador, um, pretty much up and down the hemisphere and worldwide. Uh, so just, I'd like to hear your comments on that. I'm gonna have to take my jacket off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so what I attempted to map out today is precisely that process that so many Chicanos have gone through in being displaced from their traditions. We have to understand first and foremost that this is something that was done to us. Missionization took us away from our traditions. Um, that that um, genocide, enslavement, all of these things displaced us from our traditions in a way that, you know, your great grandmothers they said, oh, you know, I'm not gonna teach my children their native language because I want them to be safe. You know, I'm not gonna teach them this ceremony because I want them to be safe. So it's important to understand that reality. Um, it's important to understand that we all have fragments in our homes and those fragments are precious. They're sacred. I have a question. Oftentimes we take them for granted those old family recipes that have been passed down, those terracotta pots, the stories of, of, of our homelands, wherever those are, those are precious and sacred. And it's important to remember those. <clears throat> it's my belief that Chicanos with indigenous ancestry have a birthright to pursue and reclaim that ancestry to the degree that they're able to do so. But as you mentioned, it's incredibly difficult. You know, Some of us may be able to trace back to that village and may be able to connect, right? Others, you may not have any idea. And that's why I think um, the Mexica tradition, I'm not gonna mission, I'm no missionary, so I'm not gonna missionize for the Mexica tradition, but the Danza tradition is a good pan-indigenous space. It's a starting point for people that are interested in learning, for people that are interested in learning the protocols um, and, and, and participating in, in, in a worldview and in an indigenized worldview. And if what I was told when I started that tradition 20 years ago is you have a birthright to this tradition. And so that's what I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna convey, right? Um, and um, so, but that said, I also think that there's like, I think it's important to do that family research in history. You may or may not have done that, but you know, go back as far back as you can. What is that village? As far back as you can go. What is the indigenous territory of that village? That might not be precise, but it's, a, it's an approximation at the very least, right? That can help, that can just lead down a path of learning of, 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 of understanding a little bit deeper, at the very least, who, who were the people in the area that your family was from, right? Um, but I, yeah, that's what I would say about that um, in, in a nutshell. Um, but I think 
even, even just gathering the fragments is a lifetime's worth of, 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 um, of work, you know? And I think we all have the capacity to do that to one degree or another. Yep. All right, uh, thanks Danny for this riveting presentation. I know that all of us were just so amazed by it all and so much information. Um, I wanted to share with you all the affirmations that you're getting from the chat as well. Everyone's thanking you. And for myself, I wanted to ask you that, of course, you introduced us to this indigenous worldview, right? A whole brand new perspective, uh, different from how we think about everything. And um, the importance of exorcising that for yourself, for folks, other folks in the indigenous community. But I'm wondering how many of us can learn from the indigenous worldview how we can apply it to how we see the world and connect it to that. I know that we're trying to build the ethnic studies program here. Many of our students will be required to take introduction to ethnic studies. Um, hopefully many will be interested in coming and experiencing this worldview. So what is your hope and vision for ethnic studies? What can it do? to help us, all of us, uh, reimagine the world. Ooh, I'm gonna take off this shirt. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of pressure. Um, so I think it's important to note that um, Native studies in particular, Native American studies, Indigenous studies is actually a global studies. There's indigenous people struggling in, in China right now, in Taiwan, in the Philippines, in India. Um, there's indigenous Europeans such as the Sami, the, the Roma, indigenous peoples in the African continent. And um, <clears throat> so I think even moving beyond the hemispheric and into the global when it comes to understanding indigeneity is incredibly important, not to mention the Polynesian islands and uh, you know, Australian Aboriginals, et cetera. Um, and that's not to generalize, um, but, you know, everybody comes from a place on this, on this earth, you know, and, and with the climate crisis, how it is, that's something that we can all get behind pretty quickly, right? Understanding the existential crisis that is the climate crisis crisis. And it's my view that indigenous knowledge systems can, can really help in that regard. You know, these wildfires that we're seeing in, in, in California, native Californians have been dealing with those since time immemorial um, in meaningful ways. And that's one of many examples. So, you know, when I teach ethnic studies, to the degree that I'm able, I try to we know the four core fields. We know it's Native American studies, African American studies, Asian American studies, and Chicanx, Latinx studies. But to the degree possible, I try to connect each one of those groups to indigenous roots first. Because <clears throat> if we're talking about decolonization, um, you have to have kind of that premise to a certain degree. Um, my hope is to so we, we filed the paperwork to get a Native American and Indigenous Studies course here at DVC. So that's in the works. We have an African American Studies uh, class that's even further along. Um, and then the goal is to get, you know, the first four disciplines and then, you know, build it out from there. You know, how can we collaborate? Uh, you know, I have folks in the music department who are saying, you know, how can we bring some of this embodied music knowledge into into conversation with that ethnic studies and i'm all about that 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 conversation you know i think that's an important conversation to have we were talking with, with uh my colleague Dave, david chong about doing a hip-hop class rooted in ethnic studies combined with a hip-hop ensemble where you get the performance part so i mean who would want to take a class like that just out of curiosity that sounds i don't know <laughs> 
I know I would have loved to have taken a class like that. I'm rambling now, so I'm gonna pass it to Albert. No, I have a... <clears throat> okay, so I have a question in the chat from Daria. Says, Professor Cornejo, thank you for sharing the process of reclaiming your culture. As a child of two immigrants, both of my parents fled their home countries. And I too feel that some of my history and traditions have been displaced even as a first generation, as first gen. Part of me is angry that I will never get to experience that feeling truly this or that. As you stated earlier in your presentation, it was hard to try and make your mosaic of traditions that you had to pick and choose from. What drove you to finally overcome this feeling of anger or anxiety of reclaiming your identity, even if it meant acknowledging an ugly part of your ancestors past? All right, I'm taking off my pants for this one. <laughs> Sorry. Stricken that one for the record. Um, <clears throat> that was a great question. Um, <laughs> see, now it's online forever. Um, stricken that one. Uh, that's a fantastic question. And I think the, the, the easiest answer is that's, that's ongoing. I still struggle with these questions every day. You know, I still, the, the fragments still cut me up every day you know, um, but I've been doing this for 20 years now. And so I've been able to develop some calluses here and there. Um, our scars teach us important things. And I think it's, it's really building off, off what you have. And it's to the degree possible, not doing it in isolation. So um, one, one example of that, that I didn't get to in this presentation was I actually began relearn or learning my people's language, but I had a basis in the Nahuatl language already. So I had studied the, I had joined a group. And so Nahuatl, just so you all know, is a Udo Aztecan language. I don't wanna to get too nerdy with the linguistic stuff. It's a Udo Aztecan language and Tequimapata is a Udo Aztecan language as well, okay? They're part of the same tree, just like Spanish, Portuguese, French as part of the Romance languages, right? Romanian part of the romance languages. Y'all didn't know Romanian was in there, did you? Yeah, now you do. <clears throat> okay, so um, building with a Nahuatl study group at UC Davis, um, that gave me a linguistic premise to then actually tackle what was in here. I think if I had just grabbed this and started to, you know, read this, I would have put it down real quick because that's so um, break the isolation of learning as, as much as you can, honor the fragments that you do carry, um, put them into practice as much as you can, because I think a lot of learning comes from doing. So if you have that recipe, cook the recipe, you know, make it your own. If you have that song, sing the song, you know, don't, don't let it gather dust. I actually put it into into practice to the degree possible because there's a lot of learning that comes through even that process. That was an excellent question. <clears throat> All right, folks, we have, we're about to wrap up, but we have, anybody have a burning question? We have anything on chat? I do. So on chat, Annie has a, a clarifying question and they say, how is theory developed from our stories? Well, I have a, um, I have a chapter in a blackness and indigeneity book coming out very soon that elaborates on this process um, a bit more. But um, ultimately, um, theory, is, is an abstraction of practice at the end of the day. And so all you're doing is flipping that paradigm around and starting with your stories, your practice and, and building theory from that. So, you know, your through your practice, you identify patterns. Through identifying patterns, you create abstractions of those patterns. And ultimately that's what theory is. So in a nutshell, that's how I would answer that. Are any of my students in here, by the way, real quick? I know there's some students on Zoom. Students on Zoom, raise your hand. No? Okay, yes, I see you. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Cool. Any other questions in the room? Go ahead, Kevin. Ask your question, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, Native American studies. I can I listen to one epic echoing question. That's okay. I love that event. I love that event. I enjoyed it. Kevin, can you try again? Ask him to type it in. Ask him to try it again. I, we oh, can you ask that question one more time, Kevin? Native American studies. What about Native American studies, Kevin? I enjoyed that event. Thank you, Kevin. Goodbye. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Well, and on that note, that's a great way. Mm -hmm. One have any closing thoughts? Um, um, Sandy, do you want to close down? Okay, folks, so with that, I mean, it's, you know, I can't say anything here. We're just, this was amazing. With Dr. Cornejo, we're so happy that he's here, part of the DVC faculty. Everybody, come on in, take intro to ethnic studies, sign up on your first day of enrollment, because we know this is what you're going to get. Um, and join us at our next Social Justice Speaker Series event, which will be on Monday. 4 p.m. November 7th. And so that is the day we'll be sending out information. Join us. It was a great time. And let's give one big round of applause. Everybody try to unmute. Thank you. 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 Thank you.